Hi, I'm Natalie McLean, editor of Canada's largest wine review site, and tonight on the Sunday Sipper Club, we have got a really extra special treat for you. The, the person I'm going to interview is someone I've admired in the wine world for a long time. I'm going to bring him in right now. He's Thomas Batchelder. Am I saying your name correctly first, Thomas? That's right. Okay, it's Batchelder in English and Batchelder in French, but it's never Batchelder. It's Batchelder. Batch of wine. Okay, good. Excellent. You've been through this drill before, I can tell. I'm just going to call you Thomas. I got that one mastered. So, <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us here tonight, Thomas. Um, just a bit of background for the maybe few people who may not know who you are. Um, you uh, have been involved in a number of very respected uh, wineries over the years, and I'm just glancing at Facebook as I say this. Um, so, what I know, but you're going to fill in the gaps where you please. There was Le Clos Jordan. Um, and now you have your own label in Niagara, you have it in Oregon and in Burgundy. You also make wine under the domain Quailus. Quailus, am I saying right. that one correctly? Quailus with a K. Quailus, good. We should have a pronunciation guide with tonight's special. <laughs> Quailus. No. And you're consulting to other wineries. So that's just sort of the quick overview. Um, folks, if you're just joining us on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, please um, just uh, chime in, let us know where you're logging in from so you know or we know uh, that you can hear us and see us. So we've got people coming in the virtual door of the, uh, the wine bar here, Thomas, and uh, soon we'll get some comments. But as we're waiting for that, why don't you fill in the gaps on your background? I know you didn't start off as a winemaker, you know, um, when you were younger. So what was the path that led you to winemaking? So because I grew up in Quebec, you know, grew up speaking French and English in Quebec and Montreal, but my family's from the Eastern Townships, uh, you know, dairy farmers, two farms. I just wanted to be in agriculture and Quebec has so much wine that I went to France to learn. And when I got out of school, my wife and I went to France, we were just married, and we got out of school in 1993, and uh, I said, I think I'm going to try to do Pinot Noir and Chardonnay for a living. And this is a time when everybody was going to University of Davis in California and learning how to make Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. California Cab was so big. The Tuscan Cabs were coming out like Sasakaya and all that, and everybody wanted Cabernet Sauvignon, and Pinot Noir was like... Uh, but at school, I met a, a girl, but I was already married. I met a girl called, and she was a girl at the time, Louisa Ponzi, and her dad and mom founded Ponzi, one of the first five uh, wineries in Oregon. And so I got dragged out to Oregon, then back to Merceau, and then uh, to Lemelson Vineyards. I helped Lemelson Vineyards start up in the, in the Willamette Valley. And by God, I've made a living all the time in Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Sometimes not a very good living, sometimes pretty good. And, uh, you know, the wine world, you're not going to get rich fast, as maybe you found out, Natalie. Oh, yeah. But you, <laughs> it's a passion thing, and you're happy with your life. Exactly, exactly. And Paul is joining us tonight. And he says, uh, I can see the comments, but Thomas, uh, you may not be able to read these till after with the replay, which is always fun. Um, Paul says, good evening, Natalie and Thomas. Looking forward to the topic tonight. Welcome, Paul. And we've got some other folks who are in there, um, just haven't commented yet. So if you are just joining us tonight, we have Thomas Batchelder, um, and he has a number of wineries. We're just getting going here. I'm really excited. I've got 11 of his wines. This isn't going to be a technical tasting, but I will be showing you as we chat. We're going to chat about 20, 30 minutes with Thomas, and then um, per our discussion from past Sunday Sipper Clubs, we will then um, uh, bid adieu to Thomas and keep the chat going, whether we want to keep talking about this particular topic or other topics. So Thomas, one part that I know you're sort of focused on the wine here, but weren't you also a journalist at one point? Right, I forgot to say that. So I was a home wine maker who couldn't stop there in Montreal. Okay. And in Montreal at the time, you went up to Jean Tonnel Market or the Central Market and you got bad Central Valley grapes. Uh, from California, but they weren't bad, they were just baked. They had no flavor, but we made pretty good wines. And then I became a journalist writing in English and in French for, for various magazines like Wine Tidings and uh, La Barrique at the time by Nicole barrett -Rayen. And uh, I just couldn't stop there. So we, after we honeymooned in France, we honeymooned before we got married, we eloped and we got married actually in Venice, but uh, we tried to get married in Burgundy, it didn't work, but Venice marriage stuck. <laughs> and got photos under the bridge of size in a gondola, gondola, and uh, 
So as I came back and tried to do journalism, John Sandbrook of the Opinion Society said to me, where I was working at the time, you know, Thomas, you've gone off and got yourself some temperate climate skills, and you've returned to a climate of extremes. He didn't say that Montreal was cold. He just said it was a climate, like Ottawa, of extremes. One, I love that climate, but it's, he said, you're going to have to move. And I was looking around Dunham and Rougemont and Petit Lac, Magog, and all the corner Quebec places where they're making wine, or they were 25 years ago. And I said, you know what? If I want to do Pinot Noir, we have to leave. And so Mary's dad had an art gallery. He said, I'll take it over. She was running it. And by God, we left and he closed it down, which was not a happy day, but he felt it was his to close. So Mary has been my partner from day one. I like to say she's 51% uh, of everything we do. Very <laughs> nice, very nice. Um, Lori, Lori says, good evening. Um, got a lot of fans in the house here, Thomas. Uh, Jen is here as well. Hi, Thomas, I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation. If you're just joining us, why don't you just um, let us know where you're logging in from and if you've ever had one of Thomas's wines. So just a quick, um, Thomas, actually, where should we start? If we're going to start, I've got um, your reds. We've got a lot of Pinots here, of course. I've got a Cab Franc from Calis. Um, and then I've got some Chardonnays. Where would you recommend we start? What, what bottles oh, we let's do, let's do the Pinots and finish on the Chardonnays and we'll do it the way they do in the Cote de Bone. Yes, why is that? Why would they start with the Pinots first? So you have to show me that you have some in your glass first. And I'll show you this. <laughs> so I have a glass of uh, uh, Oregon Pinot Noir here with uh, a Nuit Saint-Georges label on it, okay. which kind of explains my life. I think the reason they do this is, of course, I was shocked when I first heard you're supposed to return at the end of a meal with good friends to a cheese plate instead of dessert and go back to Chardon. I said, that's for alcoholics. So now I do that all the time, so I don't know what that says about me. But it's certainly, uh, often white wine for me does better with cheese. Like, as you know, and, and you know more about this stuff than me, but red wine is so sensual with cheese, but it's just that you can't really taste the red wine anymore. If it was a great burgundy, you can't say it's a shamble anymore. It's just amazing cheddar or camembert in your mouth with this amazing sensation, whereas white does tend to cut it, but I can still taste the Chardonnay. But the real reason the Burgundians do it is, Wine is so expensive over there and always has been. I think they, when they're doing a barrel tasting, they pull the reds and they taste great. And then when you go to the Chardonnay barrels, uh, they taste more focused and beautiful after the reds. And any kind of uh, sort of hard edges, uh, any sort of sort of almost almost tannins that white wines have uh, doesn't isn't apparent apparent when you've had red first out of barrel when they're young rush rough but I do it for another reason here at the Clos Jordan when we met and, and since I do it because everybody thinks they don't want Chardonnay they think they want Pinot because great Pinot is so rare and Chardonnay is ubiquitous as you know though great Chardonnay is just as rare as great Pinot so I always say if they want Pinot give them the Pinot and then <laughs> So they're not rushing through the Chardonnays right. and they have their Pinots and they're loving them and saying, I can't believe, you know, this is such a good terroir. And you go to Chardonnay and now they're warmed up. They've had their dose of Pinot and they're like, oh, you know, I don't usually like Chardonnay. Well, it's dry Chardonnay. Well, I, yeah, but even when it's dry, I don't usually like Chardonnay and they have more time for it in their head. Right. That's in a tasting. In a meal, I only do Chardonnay after Pinot at the end for cheese. Wow, I love that strategy. That's great. I can see lots of folks online tonight adopting that strategy. And speaking of lots of folks, hello to Lise, who's in Sudbury. Diane uh, Sheridan, she's joining us. She's hoping to visit Domaine Calis this summer. For, she says, Thomas, I first met you at Le Clos Jordan, and many times after that, I love your wines. So you may recognize Diane Sheridan's name. Uh, Matt sure, Steves, yeah. yes, Matt Steves is here in Ottawa. He says, Thomas is one of Canada's terrific winemakers and it's such a pleasure to listen to him, especially when enjoying one of his gorgeous wines from Ontario or got a burgundy each done beautifully. Matt Steves, of course, is on CTV Morning Live, part of our team. Tom Dean is here. Uh, hey, Natalie, hockey is done now so I can stay for the whole hour, yay. Good, I'm glad you know your priorities, Tom. And Lori is saying she tasted it at the Taste Ottawa event. Yes, we had a big tasting here, Ontario wine. So I'm supposed to prove I have Pinot to you. <laughs> now I've got three and I'm gonna guess um, that um, I've got tradition, I've got reserved to domain, and then I have this sweet child here, uh, not child, but 
uh, La Grande Reserve. So the three tiers wow. I'm thinking of so, Keyless. Yeah, so let's start with tradition. Could you show the label yeah. to the screen? Oops. So Do get... I can't see it. Does yeah, it matter they, if I can they can see it and I can see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, tradition, you see, that's Lake Ontario, okay. and that's the depths of Lake Ontario. And Calis is 12 passionate partners from Quebec okay. who wanted to buy in Burgundy okay. land, but they tasted at the Clos Jordan when I was there, and they decided that Niagara's terroir existed. So the Clos Jordan, but also Calis, you know, the, M Montreal and Toronto, Quebec, and Ontario are coming closer because of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, because Quebecers really, not that Ontarians don't, but Quebecers really love dry European style wines. And I've always said that Niagara and Prince Edward County, they're like mid-Atlantic in the sense of they're, they're a little fruitier than Burgundy, mm -hmm. but they're certainly not anything like Oregon or California or, or the Kiwi wines. They have an old world tang to them. So Kalos mm -hmm. invested in uh, Niagara and they're so proud of the terroir that they put Lake Ontario on the label, and that's why it's blue. And the different colors of the blue are the actual depths of Lake Ontario. Okay, yeah, I'm sure and, we'll again. and yeah. the Y of Calus is where the domain is. And Calus, actually, I think he's a monk. He would be the leader of the monk, the abbot, and it was in 16-something or other. He made wine, his troop made wine on the shores of Lake Ontario. I think it was near Kente or Bay of Kinti. But they made them from wild grapes. And so, uh, Jules Chevalier lives in the uh, Quartier des Sulpiciens, the Sulpiciens corner of uh, Quebec and Montreal, I mean, where all the names are named after the old monks. Oh. And Calus was one of them. He said, I like that name. Let me look it up. And when he saw they made wine, he goes, that's it. That's it. Quebecers <laughs> going to Ontario. So these are like the first Quebecers outside of me or anybody else I can think of. Oh, Francois Morissette, who's great too. But these are the first correct Quebecers adopting Ontario. You know how important that is? It's super important for our country. We're our biggest trading partners. And instead of Quebecers looking towards France, they're looking towards Ontario. Savvy wine consumers come here for a vacation instead of going to France. That's so good. Oh, wow. So the, the domain, the winery itself, um, what's it like to visit there? I haven't been to that one. Is it a, a place to go that's, you know, got the tasting yeah. room and a, a worth the visit as a destination? So what happened is there's two vineyards. One is in Beamsville on Mountain View Road where we wanted to put the winery, okay. but the Nafriatsik, the water table was too high for a cellar. Then the other property we got from the Clos Jardin, it used to be called, and you've had it many times, La Petite Colline, oh, yes. and it's owned by the Nudor family, and we got a long-term lease on that. So all Calis Pinots are the ex La Clos, La Petite Colline blend from Jordan, blended with, at every level, tradition reserve, Grand Reserve, blended with the home vineyard on Mountain View. Wow. Since uh, they couldn't get the cellar in the ground because of the high water table, they found a place in St. Anne's, which is a little farther uh, towards Lake Erie than, than if you know Featherstone or Flat Rock mm -hmm. or Westcott, a little further up, a few more kilometers, planted a vineyard there that a wicked winter killed and we're planting again this year. And it's a beautiful, what we say in French, Maison Canadienne, which we say log cabin in English. And a beautiful log cabin with a functional building next to it and a gorgeous uh, cathedral, a tasting room. But it's a destination. You have to find it. And that's, that's the bummer about not being on Mountain View in Beamsville. But you get a good reception when you get there. That's awesome. Well, it's part of the test. Are you worthy of the wine? Can you find the winery? So uh, Lise is saying he, she has a question for you, Thomas. What is your most interesting wine experience with that gar gu uh, that guitar that I see in the background. Oh. Yes. And you had a that guitar earlier. So you were warming up, I think. Are you, wait a sec, are you, is she asking about guitar yes. or that guitar? I think that's the one she sits in the background, but you are playing the one. I'm sure she'd be interested to hear both or even a little uh, ditty. At the end of the show, I'll play a song. Yes, but please. here's the thing, that song, <laughs> I was coming up with my first girlfriend from Cape Cod uh, when we were teens, like my daughter's ages now, and we stopped at this lodge. I go, Van Trapp Family Lodge, and this lady in a, what's the women's dirndl called, or is it called a dirndl? You know, the women wear the green and the smock, and from Germany, okay. you know? Yeah. And this old lady served me, and it was Maria Von Trapp, like the Julie Andrews, uh, but the real one, and I'm like, oh. 20 years later, we go back with our kids, and I don't recognize a thing. It's because it's burnt down. Oh. And they have this new thing that looks more like a double tree, but it's totally worth 
visiting. It's so historical. So many pictures of Von Trapp family on the walls. And as we leave, we're going up to Montreal to visit family because we're from Quebec originally. And we stop in Montpellier, Montpelier, the head of the um, capital of Vermont, just like Ottawa's capital of, of, of Canada. And I find in a in a antique store that little guitar that's made in Spain and sold out of England. And the Von Trapps ran a music trap, a massive yeah, music trap, music camp for many years. That's how they lived. Oh. They taught thousands of people music on the hills of Stowe, Vermont. And I said to that guy, "How long has this guitar been in the store?" He goes, uh, "About a half an hour." And he said, where does it come from? I goes, oh, you know, across the street from the Von Trapp family lodge. And I was just back from there. I said, okay, it's a Von Trapp guitar. I'm buying it. How much do you want? 75 bucks. Let's go. Wow. It's a 1940s guitar made in Spain, came through England to the Von Trapp family. I believe that. I want you to believe that. That's a great story. I love the story. I know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> that's awesome. It's a, it's a story. <laughs> um, oh, that's fantastic. Lee's love that story. And now... Oh, Lee says it was fate. Yes, indeed. So, <laughs> okay, so this is, tell me the difference then um, a little bit between the tradition and the next one up, I think, is the Reserve de Domain. Right. So, actually, Calus is going to slightly rebrand this year with the 15s. That little line that says Reserve, and on the first bottle, it's a little blue line that says Tradition. Yeah. The Reserve is a little uh, silver line. What happens as Okay, what people are going to learn, and it took me a long time because maybe I'm thick, is the bench in Niagara is the best place to grow wine. That said, okay, just let me hang that out there for a sec. People are discovering, they're rediscovering Niagara Lake, they're rediscovering Lincoln Lakeshore, which is below Beamsville, and Creek Shores, which is below uh, like the Clos Jordan, Jordan, and Vineland. And the soils are heavier there, but because Niagara comes from a glacier past, there is gravel pockets anywhere. And this is something everywhere. I wouldn't have known this when I first met you, Natalie. But then you see Francois Morissette do stuff on the plain that's totally, Pearl Morissette, that's totally mineral and stuff, and you start thinking about it. So, but in general, stuff from Creek Shores or Lincoln Lakeshore, which you can look up on a map of uh, Wine Country, Ontario, just Google that website, it's great, it has all the maps. Uh, that stuff is more four square and richer than the bench. The bench is lighter in color and finer and more mineral. Okay, so now that we've had that little bit of a, a boring lesson, <laughs> I gotta say that by the time you get to the Grand Reserve, yeah. the Grand Reserve mm -hmm. is mostly the bench. Newdorf site used to be called La Petite Colline. Okay. And that is so fine and so mineral and actually a little bit of steer. Coming down through the reserve, it's about 50-50, and you get when you start off, and I don't say entry level anymore, I don't like that when it's a $30 wine, I prefer to say village wine, or village wine at Calus de Tradition is, or tradition, that is made the same way as the other ones, it's just a little more four square. Sure. In other words, when you, I'm wearing like a rooftop shirt, when you pay a lot of money, you get a silk shirt. A silk shirt is our Grand Reserve. It's not heavier. It's lighter on its feet. It's a ballerina. The tradition is more of our rugby player. But he's solid. He dances as well as a rugby player. You know, still, you know. Yeah. I hope that you're still a writer, too. It's still in you there. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. And by the way, folks, I've just posted a link to where all of these wines are. So, Thomas, I'm going to put, they are all on the website, but people can click and see where they are in the liquor stores closest to them. Or um, the agency is also, well, there's two agencies involved with this uh, range of wines tonight. But you can also contact the agencies and buy them. And of course, can they get them from the winery directly or do they go through agency liquor store mostly? Uh, I would really love it if you asked that question again when we talk about Batchelder. Because okay. that's a real flaw and a vulnerable thing for Batchelder. Okay. For Cadiz, they can be part of a wine club, yeah. they can go to the store, they okay. can have a ship to them. And it's about licensing, and people should know that. Uh, but also, also the LCBO and the SAQ have been very supportive of Cadiz. But it's when you're making ten wines with Cadiz, it's cash as can, right? They're now the sixth vintage uh, released, and it's like, okay, what's out there right now? And so that's why Ottawa. I'm hoping my daughter chooses to go to Ottawa for school next year for you know, first year university because. Ottawa, the crazy, crazy cool city, Gatineau has become, 
You know, it's, it's like, like Gatineau changed, changed his name because it realized it was becoming cool. <laughs> Ottawa, he changed his name, it couldn't, but it's becoming cool. I don't mean you have to be cool to be real and interesting. Let's just to say that it's real interesting now, and it was less so before. You have a credible foodie scene, yeah. and then you have people. Why am I saying this? It's not to polish up, I'm saying this because if you can't find what you want in Ottawa, you pop across the river. I know that's illegal, but no one's going to challenge you, and I didn't notice any tolls or any customs on the bridge. There's a lot of on that. We really have the best of all wine worlds here, I think, in Canada at least, because we've got the SAQ right sure. across the river, and we've got the LCBO here. And yes, there's all sorts of issues about privatization and so on, which is not the topic, although we can comment on it later if you want in relation to how to buy these wines. But um, we really do get to taste a wide sampling. I was noticing that some of your wines were more in the SAQ, which is fantastic. So. Um, Okay, so we've got the grand now. I'm uh, the comments are starting to run a little bit more quickly now. Um, so if I missed your comment, folks, just repost it. I can only see five comments at a time because Facebook does this during the live uh, show, but on the replay we will see all of the comments. So they will live in perpetuity. So Lise uh, says, Thomas, FYI, many Pinot Noir lovers are here tonight. It's exciting, but I promise. To ask for my oh, oh oh but I promised to ask for Chardonnay on my next visit. That said, what is it that you are most proud of? A moment you're most proud of with uh, with winemaking or wine experience? Uh, does she mean Pinot Noir or Chardonnay or you or or what project or what country? Um, why don't you pick what what project or which or what? Yeah, what what stands out for you as a career achievement so far? I know it's not over yet. So yeah, I hope not. I mean, I think that. Uh, I think that uh, coming a Pinot Noir and Chardonnay winemaker in an era of Cabernet when I started, right? I got to school in 93. So Pinot has become cool. Uh, so that was the first thing, orienting my career and hoping it would work. Uh, but the second thing was, I'll be honest, the, the people, some people say I'll be honest all the time, but in this case it's exactly appropriate to say my favorite wine in the world is Burgundy, red and white. And I love, because I started as a journalist, I love most of the wines in the world. There's some kind of southern climates that they have a little residual sugar that wear me out and I don't drink them very often. I won't mention any, but I mean, the point is, Burgundy is where, as whatever grapes went up the Rhone, right, and, and landed in Chardonnay de Pape, and then landed in Tain Almitage, where they have Syrah, and then Beaujolais became Gamay, and, and it became Pinot, uh, again, and Chardonnay up in Burgundy. I don't know exactly how that happened. There's a lot of human husbandry that always fits in with terroir, right? Humans are part of terroir, because we recognize it, so we aid in a bit terroir. But, so Burgundy is my favorite. But here's what I've learned about life, and I had a young fellow who's going to be a great winemaker in my cellar today. We were talking up all day, because I'm going to Quebec next week. And uh, we were talking about 120 barrels from 15 and 16 and, and talking, and I said, you know what? And Natalie, you know this about your own life. You get out of school and you think, I'm going to do this and that. And then as you get along, you realize, oh, you get opportunities. They may not be the ones you think you want, and you can say yes or no. It's like marrying somebody. You can't say, when I met Mary, I can't say, hold on, I want to see if there's any other girls that present in the next three months. Just let me see, hold on, hold on. There's a, there's a no, you can't. <laughs> you can, but it probably won't work. So, uh, so what happens, you say, okay, I'm going to walk through door number one, or I'm going to leave that door unopened, right? And so, and so what happened was when I walked through the Pinot and Chardonnay door in Burgundy, where they evolved, they are the best there. There's such a difference in terroir. However, what has changed the opportunity, the other doors I've walked through is, I didn't want to work in the middle. I didn't want to live in Oregon. I certainly didn't want to live in Niagara. It's like, oh my God, I just saw St. Catharines as you know, this big long strip mall, and I wanted to live in wine country in Burgundy. But after living in Oregon and getting a shot to come to the closure of Dan, I realized how great Niagara was. And all these things I didn't want to do taught me so much about life. And in the meantime, something kind of terrible for Burgundy happened, and this happened to Batchelder too, were making the least Burgundy of anything. The, they had, you know, you know it, they had, like I said, they had hail, they had short crops, they had cold weather, they had hot weather, and they've had now six short crops in a row, to the point where probably everybody listens to you and follows you as a wine lover, but I'm thinking of a millennial or a hipster going into a store, there's no burgundy left in the SAQ and the LCBO. I mean, of course there is, if you really look for it. It's mostly Bourguin Pinot Noir, 
Bourgain Chardonnay, Chablis, Macon Village. Now, I love all those things. Great. And a lot of Beaujolais. Beaujolais. And Beaujolais, Beaujolais are starting to have single vineyard names on them, right? right? They, they used, used to just have Morgan, right. but it's now Morgan, you know, Le Puy. And, and my, my point, point about that is it's because there's a dearth of Burgundy. And, and so, so there's something to the highest bidder, mm-hmm. which is their... So, so people have to cut their teeth. If they, they want to know Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, they don't hear this... What I'm saying about, oh, you know, it's greatest in Burgundy and the most fine, they have to, so they find out New Zealand, they find Oregon, and we're finding out, you know, you look at Norman Hardy's Pinots and Chardonnays, or what the close started, or what Carl Kaiser started back in, Kaiser started back in the day in Eskillen, or what the Bosques did at, um, uh, at Chateau Charmin, that's now been followed up by Taz. Taz makes, like, mind-blowing mm-hmm. Pinot and Chardonnay at its best. So does Shiraz over in Malivar, and, and so does Hidden Bench, and many more I could mention, right? So Niagara and Prince Edward County are starting to have a quorum of mineral-laced, which is not so true, or shall I say, no, it's true everywhere there's mineral everywhere, but it's not true that there's limestone mineral-laced everywhere. Yeah, and Prince Edward County has limestone? more limestone. Yeah, what's, what's that? Why is limestone so uh, pivotal for Pinot as opposed to other types of mineral minerals or stones? Like, what is it about limestone? Because it makes the wine pop and pop in an elegant way, pop not in a heavy way. So, if you taste any of our Oregon wines, mm-hmm. you'll see they're made in the same sensitive way, but they have uh, they have a sort of almost I don't want to say saline. Who said that? Let's, Let's say a savory finish, because Oregon's bedrock is sedimentary sandstone from the sea. Okay. So, and, 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 and you do get that kind of, yeah, that's, that's what I got, got here, too. too. Cheers. It's, it's Sunday night. <laughs> it sounds nowhere in your second, though. Are we allowed to have our first class? Of course. <laughs> it's mandatory. It's on theme. <laughs> You're trending right yeah. now. <laughs> if yes. we waited for the sun to set in the summer, we would never drink. <laughs> that's true. But, okay, so pop. Just a little bit more on that. So, so if you are, if you go to Oregon mm-hmm. and you go to California and you go to New Zealand and some of New Zealand has limestone, and you just get into the local wine scene, you will find more elegant pinots, more mineral pinots, more jammy pinots. You'll find them all, and you'll find the style you like. And if you're a Burgundian lover, you know I can name you which tang you like in Oregon, for instance. But and so we're trying to make our wines in the same way everywhere. Calus is made the same. Bachelors made the same in all three countries. Anybody I work for, because the idea of the Burgundian idea is, remember Burgundian lives, let's say, uh, where? Okay, in Pomard. The village north of that is Bone. The village south of that is Volnay. Their tractor to go out and spray, even organic people have to spray organic, you know, sulfur. They, they're only going to go as far. They only buy vineyards, the small growers, as far as their tractor will go in a day and be able to spray, come up and fill up with water and sulfur and go back out. So traditionally, the small growers are within two or three villages. So what are their techniques of winemaking? Their techniques are to let the villages pop and not their winemaking style. So Burgundians have transparent winemaking. So you can't, when you copy a Burgundian, all you're copying is transparent winemaking. So I use the same barrels everywhere, at Cavis, at Batchelder, in all three places, in an effort to make the local terroir pop. But especially in Niagara and Burgundy, and, and really in St. Prince, Prince Edward County, County, the limestone finish is when the wine is going across your palate with beautiful, uh, a beautiful long finish, and then all of a sudden there's this chalky thing that goes, think uh, think vulvic mineral water instead of Evian, you know. It has a real mineral tang, and in Oregon it does too, but it's a more savory thing because of the sandstone. And, and sometimes, sometimes volcanic, but so you, you get hooked on limestone wines, but it's not they're the best. Well, they're the best because they come from Burgundy. But outside of that, I, I want to just take, take a step back. There's a huge opportunity for Canadian wine right now because we have limestone and we make European style wines, not by because we want to, because it's the only way we can do it because they're they're deft, they're lighter, they're fast on their feet, they're not heavy. These wines or what a cool climate, we're living in a cool climate era, that's what people want, and they don't know Burgundy anymore. They can't pay, maybe they can pay 60 bucks a bottle, but it's not on the shelves. Right. Tell me how many are out there, right? And most of the stuff I started buying at 30, 40, 50, 60 bucks uh, are now 100 to $300. And so I'm not bitching against Burgundy because I work there, but I'm just saying there's a huge opportunity for Canadians to wrap their mind around 
the limestone mines, not just Pinot Chardonnay, but also, you know, Riesling and Cabernet Franc and Gamay and a few others that Ontario is producing. Like, it's our, it's our time that's coming, right? Oh, that's it really exciting. is. I love how you're phrasing that, too, or how you're putting it. It's like a rallying call. Um, and we've I've been caught up. First, these are amazing. I, I'm not commenting. I'm just um, enjoying them as you're talking, Thomas. They're amazing. I just, the finesse, the length, everything. This isn't a technical tasting, but they're just, they are mind-blowing. I love, love your style of winemaking. So, so, so one, one thing about Kedos is, and, and this, this is what I'm learning slowly, and I, I'm, I'm hoping what I'm saying to people is, whether they're phoning in from Quebec or Ontario or BC or the States, is you got to visit Niagara and Prince Edward County to get it. Mm -hmm. And until you go to Bone mm -hmm. and you realize that, you know, uh, like I just said, to reiterate, one stop south of the bone is Pomar, two stops is is Volnay, and three stops is Merceau, and you're in white wine country with Chassin and Puny, and you learn that in Niagara too. You see where the mountain is, it's not really a mountain, it's a escarpment, and you, and you taste the wines on site, and you say, I have to follow these, and it's totally followable. But the one thing that Janice Robinson ever got wrong in her life was she says, Canada is not big enough in the Okanagan or in Ontario to export. And I think what we need to do is get rid of the shitty grapes, and then we'll have a lot more land. There's about 40 grape types planted here, and there should be like maybe eight. Because wow, yeah. a lot are not winter hardy, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, anyway, that's that's just a little diatribe. But Calus, especially, when you see the difference, if you ever taste batchel grains, Calus, people always ask me, oh, do you macerate Calus more? And there at Calus, I work with uh, Kelly, Kelly Mason, who's the associate winemaker. She's wonderful. Mm -hmm. so I can't do it all, and she's doing most of the floor. And we're trying to do it the same way, but here's what you learn when you come to Niagara, which is what I was talking about, the villages. Our villages are like Grimsby, Beamsville, Vineland, Jordan. They roll out the same way as you know yourself. Along the escarpment, they roll out the same way Burgundy does in, in a row. Uh, probably not as quaint the villages, but they're cute. And Beamsville is close to the lake. It gets a lot of sun, and it's a little more four square. And it's especially four square just below the escarpment where the Cavus vineyards are. Good news is, you got color and weight. And so, like I said about the root shirt and the silk shirt, expect lots of flavor and richness in our tradition, which is, again, not an entry level because it's 25 to 30 bucks, but, and it's like a Christmas wine for some people, mm -hmm. a special occasion wine for some people, a Tuesday night wine for people of more means or who are just totally bitten. But as you go up in Cavus, you get more finesse, no more weight, just more finesse and more attention to detail. Uh, fantastic. Um, and um, folks, I'm sorry, you're going to have to keep reposting because this is just so much in so interesting. John, John Steves is here, si sipping Niagara Pinot Noir and engaged uh, with Natalie and Thomas, talking fantastic about fantastic Pinot. What a great Sunday evening. John, I'm so glad you could join us. Lori, um, let me just make sure. Oh, they're going off the screen. Lori, do you know which restaurants in the Ottawa Gatineau area that carry your wines, Thomas? Uh... You know, that's, that's what, what I was going on about Ottawa before, because yeah. when I come up there, we, we visit like 20 restaurants. Oh. Like, I, my, my, my second girlfriend, ooh, I mean, this is a story about my girlfriends. <laughs> well, I've been married for 28 years, I was, right, I was allowed to have girlfriends before. But, you know, when I went up to visit my girlfriend's family in Ottawa, I remember we used to go to like one restaurant on Preston and Little Italy, and then Little Chinatown, there was one restaurant, and then there was Mexicali Rose or something, and there was a couple things in the market. Now, everywhere, What's the Hintonburg? Hintonburg, yeah, right? Yeah, Hintonburg. All your and, and whalebone yep. and fauna and all these crazy restaurants in the market that are beyond the market now on every way. Like, like you, you guys, guys are on fire. fire. I would guess. I can't prove it. I would guess that Ottawa's restaurant foodie wine scene is growing faster than anywhere in the country. Now, now, did you say that Ottawa's better? No, I didn't. I'm saying that Vancouver, Montreal, and you know maybe Calgary, and of course Toronto. Are, are on fire and way up here, but, but they're growing like this. Sure, we've got a larger base, this. yes. We, we've got yeah, a smaller base, so our percentage couldn't get bigger. <laughs> oh, so it's an exciting city. I mean, I don't know how many viewers are from there, so we better start, stop talking about it. Maybe they're all from Toronto, and why do we have to listen to this? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's what they're saying, Thomas. Um, if you're just joining us, we have Thomas Batchelder uh, from lots of wineries, his own label, Domaine Calis, formerly La Clos Jardin. Um, 
please let us know where you're logging in from. Just uh, give us a shout out, what city. How about just a yes or a no from all of those who are already online. Have you ever had one of these wines? Or which one was your favorite? Just yes or no, that kind of thing. I'm just interested. It looks like um, everyone who's at least commenting, we always get lots of people who are watching but not commenting, and I, I'm totally cool with that till you get brave. Um, but who's had uh, one of these wines that we're talking about tonight? Um, Thomas, okay, so I jumped ahead while you were talking because I couldn't help myself um, to La Grand Reserve. So yeah. this, you have already mentioned, would have the most... We said 2013. This is the 2013, yes. So, wait, so how was that vintage for you? Oh, it was a cool vintage, which for Chardonnay and Pinot was wonderful. Okay. You know, we want that drive of a cool vintage. Remember, the best Pinot is like a perfect ripeness is 12 o'clock noon or just this right here mm -hmm. so five minutes after noon for for pino is uh slightly round okay. uh you know i'm thinking burgundy 02 or 05 or 10 and i don't know how much people know niagara so it's easy to talk about burgundy really 12 15 is over ripe and jammy okay but five to noon see this is where you have to be influenced by burgundy and this is what Oregon has a hard time with as, as a state. They're more influenced by California than they are by Burgundy. And Burgundians know that at 5 to noon is the best time to pick because things are bright. They're not green at 5 to noon, they're green at quarter to noon. Okay. By the way, I'm not talking about noon, I'm just using a metaphor, right? Yeah, yeah, and so bright fruit. See, Pinot should dance between red and black fruit, and it should have, you know, you say, oh, that's framboise, you know, that's, no, 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 no it's strawberry. Oh, no, there's a little cassis in there. And, and that's what it does as it opens up throughout the meal. But it just does that because it's a thin skin grape. So there's only so much anthocyanins that can come out of that grape skin to color the white pulp as you put it in the vat. But the good news is because the, like, Merlot skins are like rubber, uh, Syrah, Syrah skins are like rubber, rubber Cabernet Sauvignon, and, and I mean that in a good, good way, like they're, they're thick they're and they have lots to give. Yeah. And right? they're not as susceptible to disease and rot and mildew and that's right. whispering in a vineyard and all that. Yeah. That's, that's right. right, and that's why, and that is why uh, people always talk about, uh, you know, Pinot rotting because it is a thin skin, but that, don't look at the downside, oh my god, my neighbor's on a John Deere outside the window. <laughs> <laughs> so if you start here, I'm sorry, I'll come closer. But John, you're riding one more. I live on the edge of the country in Fonkel. But the thing is that um, Pinot, because, well, we got to stop talking about the rock, but it's okay to talk about it. But because the skins are thin, they let perfume come out instead of just deep flavors. It's perfume, and they let the sense of place come out, right? So, so we, we work with great Merlot at Cato, and great Cabernet Franc, for instance, but, but those deep wines that have a tougher time showing where they're from, although they do, okay. I mean, you, you can, can tell when the San Giovese is from California and the one's from Chianti, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've yeah. never had a San Giovese from California that tasted like San Giovese to begin with, but I mean, that's another subject you probably have because you've tasted them all, but uh, I think that Pinot's thin skin is a plus, not a negative. And uh, one, one thing I wanted to say about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, Chardonnay before I forget, it, again, with people looking at the wrong side, when people look at the evaporation in a barrel, their eyes go up, like mine now, and they say, oh, the angel share. It's true, it is. But what's really happening is a reduction in the barrel, meaning like a reduction sauce on your stove, and I hope you're all cooking at home tonight. I will be shortly for my daughter. My wife's on a trip out to Jasper with my eldest. And... Um, as you make a reduction sauce on the stove, it's more intense. So too, as wine naturally evaporates over the 16 months, it gets more intense, has more texture, more sense of place, and less van de cepage, which in English is varietalness. Varietalness is not something you look for in the great terroir wines of the world. Varietally correct is entry-level wines and medium-level wines, right? But, like, remember that Europeans didn't know that... Uh, Morgon was Gamay and Bone was Pinot. But the, I mean, before the last era of marketing we're living in now, they would say, let's start our Christmas dinner with a Morgon because I like that flavor and that sense of place, and let's move to a bone on the turkey because it'll work. And that's the way we've got, I mean, Mondavi started, and he was a great man. He, he took us from calling things, you know, Sancerre and, and Champagne and, and Hardy Burgundy, and he made us call them by the grape types. 
But now we have to do the next step ourselves, which is you shouldn't be calling something uh, Pinot Noir too much. You should be calling it that great red from Beansville or from that single vineyard. Because Chardonnay and Pinot can become commodities, but single vineyards and sense of place can never be copied. Exactly. And we can collect more and more of them. It's like collecting shot glasses when you go around the world. You can collect in airports. You can collect wines from around the world and go on this journey of discovery, which you do, which you help people with. I know. No, that's a great way to put it, remembering the place, because that's, it. well, it's just like going on a vacation. I mean, it's that sense of place, that those memories are associated with place. And I know that when I have traveled around the wine world, it's implanting the geography in your memory, literally, because the, the smell and the taste and the, the place and the visuals, they all come and they weave together in this sort of sensory map that you will never forget. Um, right, so I want to I I underline, underline what you're saying. saying. You, you said, said something, something important, important. It was beautiful and poetic. poetic. So, so if, if you, you go, go to Oregon, Oregon right, right, this is an Oregon hat that I'm drinking. Yeah. If, if you, you go, go to Oregon, Oregon and well, no, no Natalie, you've, you've been, been everywhere, but let's say you have somebody listening who drinks Oregon and dreams of going there. Okay. And so when we say stuff about wine, like it's bottled poetry and it's sunshine captured in the glass, those are, of course, purple prose from people writing wine notes or wine books when they're drunk or whatever, or just so passionate and sober, let's say. But the thing is, it really is, and I know it really is, and when the Burgundians get you in their cellar, you could be there. You can't schedule three visits in a day. You got to schedule two because you know you're going to drink at lunch too, and you're in Burgundy on holiday. And if you just catch a glint in their eye that they're having fun, then they start opening old bottles, and they'll try to figure out your birthday. And with women, it's especially hard because nobody wants to get pick the wrong decade. My God! Oh, we could pick one younger, but then you don't get to taste as old as wine. Blah blah blah. But when you stand there and say, you know, well, the year I went to school, right? So 1993, oh my God, what was I doing? How young was I? Who was I hanging out with? What kind of summer was that? Wine brings all that back. You know, a banana doesn't. You just want to eat a banana before it rots. And I love bananas. So if everything you said about bringing back physical memory stuff to that reader out there of yours or that listener who's never been to Oregon, but, but loves Oregon. Oregon. When they go, they'll be truly marked for it by life if they have the rise of them, right? That's true. That's true. And it's it's like the um, the memories we hold most or that get most deeply implanted are those that are cemented or whatever, put in amber by emotion. And wine triggers emotion. And you'll always remember for the good and the bad um, that are laden with emotion. And so when you go to these places and drink the wines and you're having that good time with the guy with the glint in his eye or the winemaker, that is what you'll remember because it's all, again, brought together for you that way. I'm it's totally true. losing the track of these comments, but that's all right because we're having such a great conversation, Thomas. If you are, Elaine Bruce has said there's a bit of an echo. Elaine, um, I'm still trying to optimize the technology, but sometimes if you turn your volume down, you won't get as much of an echo. I'm not hearing it. I know Thomas was hearing it a little bit, but we're doing our best to optimize this over time. So give that a try, Elaine. Lori Demings, I know you've been commenting and you keep falling off the ledge there of the comments, Lori, but I appreciate it and uh, keep trying. Um, Giuseppe Sportelli, um, I like organic wine. It is uh, the best te testing of grape growing. Cool. Okay. Uh, Lori, uh, is a comment to Thomas, you're not drinking your own wine. What is your favorite Pinot? Uh, oh, you mean if I'm not drinking my own wine, what no, is my favorite? No, she's saying you're not drinking your own wine right now. Well, I was drinking, yeah, I'm drinking Batchelder, Oregon. Oh, okay, right that now. one. Right, you said you had Oregon wine in a burgundy glass, but it's that, that Oregon. Oh. Yes. Okay, okay listen. Can, can we, we pick, pick up on the organic thing? thing? But first yeah. I want to honor Lori. Yep. So can, can you, you hold up uh, any, yep. of any of my bottles, bottles that have this? I've got the Oregon right here. You want the Oregon? So the left side is the vineyard of Oregon. The yeah. middle is Niagara, the heart of the project and where we live. We're Canadian. And the right side is burgundy. Those three vineyard symbols, we didn't have a family crest. So that became the crest saying that we worked in three countries. And the reason we worked in three countries is because I had worked in three countries. So let's say you win the lotto tomorrow and you say, we didn't throw like a dart at a map and say, let's make Pinot in three northern hemisphere you know, countries that all have harvest at the same time. What idiot would do that, you know? But well, we did. But it was because, you know, we were a, a young, childless couple in Burgundy 
And then the kids were born around the time we went to Oregon to work for Lemelson Vineyards, to start up Lemelson Vineyards were there at Lemelson. And the kids went through elementary school and high school in Niagara with the closure of Dan and now these projects. And so if you win the lotto tomorrow, well, Natalie, let's not use you as an example because you probably could, but most people, if they won the lotto or if they were just naturally fortunate and they went to Burgundy, Niagara, or Oregon, or, or Keyland and said, I want the best grades. You can't get it. These people are paysan. They've had their roots, like Batch Caters is a small domain that grows organically. Batch Elder is what's called in France a micro negos. We buy grapes on long term contracts, hopefully from the same plot and the same rows every year. Right? I can't, I don't have money to buy vines, so this is how we're doing Batch Elder. But the thing about it is, you know, you can't walk into a wine region with a lot of money and say, oh, you know, give me Clos Rougeau. You can't do that. People work on a handshake and they work on long term. So we realized when we started Batchelder that because I was a journalist, I like you, I had this curiosity. And even though I've been a winemaker for many years, and I, what if Oregon, what if you don't like Oregon? Let's say you don't, uh, because you find it too heavy handed. But what if we did it? with the same sensibility that Burgundy has done. Mm -hmm. And what I found, of course, conversely is, what if people love Oregon and Niagara and they've never heard of Burgundy, which is happening more and more because it's so expensive, and they think it's austere and hard, and so they taste one of your Burgundies and they say, oh, this is like your Niagara, except different. Like, the world's upside down, it's changing so fast, right? Mm -hmm. When we do the I4C, uh, the Cool Climate Chardonnay Celebration, third week in July, which, you know, is a lovely event, wineries come from around the world to, to pour their Chardonnays in Niagara, which Niagara's always a home team, so it's really great for Niagara, but the winemakers have gotten better and better at Chardonnay because of it, because they're tasting everything. And they're tasting Merceau and Chassain and Central Otago and, you know, Southern Chile and everything. And I'm watching, and these excited couples and groups of women and groups of men go, oh, look, did you see over there from California? It's Kistler. Oh, my God, it's David Ramey. And they say, oh, and I like that gray-haired guy's wine, too. Well, they weren't talking about me. They were talking about Jacques Larger from Louis Jadot, one of the best. He's standing right beside me. I was like, my knees were weak. I was beside him. And they go, oh, and I like the gray-haired guys. Yeah, that wine costs 150 bucks. It's called Chassin Montrachet Premier Cru. But the world's upside down now. Anything's possible for the new world. Even anything. Discovering terroirs is now. Like the monks in Burgundy was a thousand years ago. They discovered all the terroirs. We're still discovering them now. But you don't discover them if you make 15 buck varietal wine. Although we all need that. I'll put my hand up for that. But I mean, the great wines that are sort of long aged in barrel and then a year in bottle that taste of their place, those wines are going to come to define the new world, right? Wow. And uh, we just all have to live long enough and uh, and drink enough to discover it along with the people who are doing it. I'll drink to that. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> That's a great way to put it, Thomas. I mean, people really do need to, as you say, cut their teeth on the wines that are available to them and that are affordable and yet, you know, still have that, that minerality and that finesse like these these wines oh my goodness guys thank you for chiming in here um okay so i want to i don't want to miss out on at least mentioning some of these other wines that i have here so we've got the three tiers of the the calis that we went through with the pinot and we've talked we've touched on the oregon pinot noir here i think i just got the one from oregon i may have i don't i don't think i have an oregon chardonnay I've got 11 of your wines here. It's um, I'm in a sea of happiness. <laughs> um, oh, you know what? I'm going to teach you something. You have read your books and you've taught me a lot, but I'll teach you one thing. And you're and only because for your readers. Okay. So Oregon is spelled O-R-Y-G-U-N, like Oregon, Oregon, like gun. And if you say Oregon like a gun, Oregon. not quite that bad, but if you say gone like, like I'm gone, yeah. Then they know you're not from Oregon. Okay. So you got to swallow the gun, the like gun. Oregon. So Oregon. This 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 episode needs to come with its own pronunciation guide, or is that a pronoun <laughs> pronunciation guide? So we've got Batman. your last name. We've got Kalis. We've got Oregon. Is it Oregon? And Bachelder. 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 Uh, Kalis and Oregon. You know what the thing is? What? <laughs> At the risk of embarrassing you, I said that because you have such a wide. Uh, group of people listening to you that it's good for them all to know that's oh, it Oregon. Is. Oh. And they'll be cooler when they go there. 
I don't get embarrassed. I, I, I want to be corrected publicly. <laughs> I revel in it. <laughs> it makes me stronger. I am the phoenix. Anyway, um, okay, so Lori is saying, what is the most expensive wine you've ever purchased, Thomas, and was it worth it? Yeah, so to finish the last question in one sentence, Yes. the most, the best wines I've ever had are from Burgundy. Mm -hmm. The most exciting wines I've ever made are from Oregon and Niagara because you get to define the terroirs. If any of you were in the cellar with me and we had 10 barrels of a single vineyard, we would probably all agree, in, and Natalie's done this with me, on which ones showed what we thought was that terroir. And that's where humans come into terroir. If you just put them all together, it's a little muddled. Even a single vineyard, you're better to declassify a few barrels and to get the heart of what that is. So that's why. But what's particularly exciting about Niagara right now is that anywhere we go, and we're going places as a group, like Niagara and BC are traveling to Canada House in London this May in Trafalgar Square for the second time in a row. All of the A-list writers come. They want to know about Canada. It's expensive to travel Canada. We're clearly coming on. The stuff that Carl Kayser and Donald Zeraldo dreamed of at Enniskillen, that the Bosques dreamed of and all the other pioneers is actually happening now. It's, we're never going to be a huge exporter. Genesis was wrong, right in that. But she was wrong in that we wouldn't be exported. People have a thirst for mineral tighter wines, not goopy wines right now. They want wines that are becoming more savvy about their food, so they want wines that dance and are a little lighter footed with their food. They want wines that are 12.5 or maybe 13, not 14.5 and 15, right? So all, but when I go to New York City with, with the same group, we have a group called Somewhereness, and sometimes it's just the Canadian Trade Commission that helps us get there. Uh, and, and I'm pouring Canadian wines because it's a Canadian show. And uh, they say, oh, I hear you make Burgundy in Oregon, too. And I'm like, yeah. And uh, they go, but I'm here for your Canadian wines. I'm, and I'm like, we go to BC. They're part of Cascadia, Oregon, Washington. They're Cascadians. I go out there with the Bachelor Oregons, which are fine and lovely and really mineral and pretty. And BC is always asking me for Ontario. I'm like, what? It's changing right now, and BC is also coming into its own. As you know, Nova Scotia is coming into its own. Quebec's trying harder and harder and getting some great wines, too. So as a country, we're going to be on the radar. It doesn't help that we have a pretty cool and young wine, uh, prime minister. And by that, I don't mean to get political in Ottawa. I just mean to say most girls find them good-looking, and they prefer that than an orange comb-over. And, and that, at the same time... Are you talking about orange time, wines? Are we... Going off topic here with the orange wine? <laughs> we didn't talk about organics. <laughs> no, that's true. We go where the conversation takes us. But sorry, I interrupt you. Keep going. <laughs> no, let's talk about organics. Organics, I came out of wine school, to honor that other question, I came, so the, I came out of wine school and I said to Mary, I am going to buy someday, I don't know how, a domain in Burgundy. I'm going to never filter my wines and I'm going to be organic. Well, uh, I never bought a domain in Burgundy, but I continued to work in Burgundy. I worked for three domains there, and of course made my own wines there, so that's kind of okay. See where it takes you. Filter. I, oops, I just dropped something on. You told me I'm not supposed to drop anything or thump the table. <laughs> okay. So, filtering wine. To say that an unfiltered wine is better than a filtered wine is to say that wine owes its qualities to the properties suspended